Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction, Andres. Um, so, there's two ways to think about what I'm going to be trying to do in the next hour 20. One way to think about it is I'm going to talk about quant models of banks and shadow banks. Um, another way to think about this is that I'm going to be talking about sort of how to introduce I.O. tools, sort of modern industrial organization tools, into financial intermediation. And I want to think about this broadly from two perspectives. In an hour 20, it's going to be hard to get them both in. But what I want to give you a bit of a flavor is like how to use these tools, why they're useful, what we get out of it. And second, I want to convince you a little bit that kind of using, let's call it the economics or logic or focus of I.O. is going to be kind of useful when we think about financial inter intermediation. So several sort of standard concepts uh, become quite useful. So the way I'm going to think about this is I'm going to think about kind of how do I sneak in standard structural I.O. tools on you and how do I tell you where to modify them to account for financial services slash financial intermediaries, okay? And kind of we're going to be talking about three things. We're going to be talking about demand and kind of the standard tools to estimate demand systems and then little alterations that are useful in finance. Supply, there's going to be quite a lot of alterations to get things fun for finance. And then a little bit about equilibrium, uh, think of bank runs, okay? So when I'm going to think about demand, what I want you to take away big picture from the demand side is you can estimate really demand, rich demand systems using these tools. The estimation is pretty straightforward. Um, that's on the tool side. On what we get out of it is the basic way that we're going to think about demand is we're going to think about demand for differentiated goods. So one of the big differences, I think, that I want to emphasize is that when I'm going to look at how consumers pick financial products, I'm going to think fundamentally about consumers thinking about banks and financial intermediaries as being differentiated. So they're going to think about Bank of America differently than Wells Fargo differently than Quicken Loans. And that's going to be quite important. It's going to be important because, well, it'll lead you to sensible choices in the data. Uh, but it'll also give intermediaries market power. And when you think about market power, that's going to be important because it's going to feed into a bunch of standard things that we're kind of interested in that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. The second reason why demand systems are going to be useful to think about is if you're thinking about things like policy. Okay? When we Think about, let's say, shrinking the financial system. When we want to shrink banks, we're going to want to think about what that does to consumers. And what I mean by what that does to consumers, I really mean do consumers get less surplus. And being able to estimate it and compute it and sort of see where these, does the impact of policy lie, and specifically how much. How much do consumers lose or gain? Which consumers lose or gain? That's going to be quite important because we're going to be able to, I think that's especially useful for macro crowd, build in really, really rich consumer heterogeneity. So we're going to be able to talk about sort of who gains. Is it the rich, the poor? If you want to think about sort of a hot topic right now, which is redistribution. Uh, we're going to be able to talk about sort of which areas gain. Is the high house price, low house price areas, and so on. That's going to be going to have quite a rich policy implication. Okay. When I think about supply, I'm going to start off with a pretty basic tool, Bertrand Nash competition for differentiated products. So think Bertrand competition, where you get pretty quickly to competitive prices. But now we introduce product differentiation, and all of a sudden we have market power. And market power is going to play an important role on the supply side for many reasons. One, it's going to be a source of rents. Uh, why do we care about sources of rents? If you think about franchise value as the reason why banks stay alive, uh, where you get franchise value is it's an accumulation of rents that firms get from their market power in the future. Okay, So when you think about bank stability, rents are going to make pretty play a pretty big role. Uh, the second reason why it's going to be important, especially for a macro crowd, is market power is a source of limited pass-through. There is a reason why we don't pass cost shocks for monetary policy or non-standard monetary policy through to consumers, and that's market power. And market power in these models is going to come from two things. One is consumers think about differentiated product, and second, banks compete uh, on this dimension. Okay. So these are pretty standard tools if you think about it. I won't really need many modifications to account for finance. If we want to think about finance, then we can, we're going to start thinking about a bunch of interesting things that are going to change how we model supply. Rather than just like, here's a cost. We have a widget. It costs five. Consumers value it at seven. So I'm going to price it at six to get you know 
to get some market share, okay? What are some of the things we're gonna try to model? We're gonna try to model things like bank stability. The fact that consumers care whether the seller is alive or not is gonna play a big role in, in, in banks. It's called bank runs, okay? Um, we're gonna think about policy and how do we model capital requirements? How do we model competition with these other intermediaries called shadow banks that are regulated differently than standard banks? Um, and, at the end, I hope I gave you a little bit of a flavor of, wait a second, we have this other thing called the securitization market. How do we think about modern banks rather than banks that just have deposits and loans? Um, I will run out of time at that point. Um, but I will like to sort of point out there's a bunch of other interesting things where finance differs from I.O., such as you pretty much have market power in both your input and output market. And I don't really know what an input and output is anyway, but let's call input deposits and output loans. You might have market power in both, and both you have consumers, uh, so that looks quite a little bit different. Um, the second thing that kind of leans into this is consumer finance, which again, I'm just gonna give, try to give you a little bit of a flavor on the demand side, but things I'm not gonna talk about today but highlight are gonna be things like consumer search. It's gonna be important. Asymmetric information plays an important role. Think of this as frictions on the production side and maybe the interaction between the two which I'm happy to talk to any of you after, uh, after I do this. I tried different ways of doing this lecture. Uh, at the end of the day, I decided I'm just gonna walk you through two papers, uh, simplify, throw out a bunch of stuff, emphasize things, because I couldn't figure out a better way to do it. So, example one, I'm gonna be talking about a quantitative model of, oops, quantitative model of bank runs. Okay, this is based on my work with uh, Mark Egan and Ali Hurtatsu. Um, that, you know, uh, but the point is gonna be, we're gonna start with trying to introduce basic IO tools into a bank run model to get something like a quantitative model of bank runs. Uh, why do we want something like that? I mean, if you think about US banks, uh, they're still largely funded by deposits, to the tune of three quarters of their liabilities, and about half of those are uninsured, okay? So, if you think Diamond Divvig about, you know, let's call it, a third of your funding is uninsured deposits, maybe US large commercial banks are subject to bank runs. Um, what would you have to sort of know to decide if that's true? Well, first, we all know how standard sort of bank runs work, right? Like consumers think the bank is gonna go down, they withdraw deposits, that makes the bank less profitable, so it actually might fold. But for any of these things to work, you kind of need to know quantitative ingredients. One is, do uninsured depositors actually care if a bank's going down? I mean, in Diamond Divvik, it's super explosive. Like, you're like, oh my God, the bank's gonna die, I'm gonna pull all of my deposits. If you ask regulators, they're gonna tell you things like, uninsured deposits are a fairly stable source of funding, which is kind of, in some ways, the polar opposite from like, they're gonna run like hell when they whiff default. Which one is it, how much is it? Do actual depositors care about default? Second, how much? Third, can we build that into a model? Second, uh, do they care enough? And third, can we actually make this work, okay? I'll give you a little bit of a flavor of data so I'm not just talking, but then I'm gonna quickly get into a model because I wanna talk tools, okay? The methodology lecture. So, do consumers care about banks defaulting? So, what I have here is I have Citi and JP Morgan. Down here I have their CDS rates. Up there I have the market share that they have of the uninsured deposit market, okay? And I'm normalizing the market shares, so that think of this as a diff and diff regression ballpark, normalizing their market shares to what the market share was in 2007, okay? And all I want you to notice is, okay, both of their CDSs went up during the crisis, both were a bit less, uh, you know, uh, seem a bit less stable. Um, but Citi definitely looked substantially less survivable than JP Morgan. And what happened at the same time the city's market share of uninsured deposits shrank, okay? In other words, it seems like depositors ran away from city or walked away from city or abandoned city, whatever word you want to use, uh, to go to other banks or maybe exit the banking market altogether, okay? If you think, well, but wait a second, this is just like city just sucked and depositors didn't really want to bank with city, so like they just kind of left city because city had crappy services. Um, these are the insured depositors of city. So, same picture on CDS, but now you have a city market share of insured deposits versus JP Morgan. And if you see anything, 
Citi g maybe gained a little bit of market share in the insured deposit market. So it didn't seem like people just started disliking Citibank. It was the uninsured depositors that did. We can do this in our regression and so on, and it'll tell us something like, yeah, depositors leave banks that are, that are less sound. What does that mean? That means there's a potential for bank runs. Let's see if we can actually make this into a quant model. So how are we gonna do it? We're gonna think about consumer choices, okay? We're gonna di directly model how do consumers choose whether they wanna put deposit into a bank or not on the demand side, and then we're gonna force model the supply side of the bank to see whether there's this reinforcement that results in multiple equilibrium, okay? So this is a very, very, very standard IO setup that I'm gonna use as my basic tool. So if you remember nothing else in this kind of talk, from a tool's perspective, next couple of slides is where you wanna sort of stay with me, okay? So how do we think about it? We have a, we have a bunch of consumers, and we're gonna think about the utility of consumer J putting a dollar of deposits with bank K. Okay. What is the indirect utility they get out of this? So we're measuring this in utils, remember, okay? Well, the indirect utility is gonna depend on a bunch of stuff. First, it's gonna depend on the interest rates offered. Okay, so in other words, if interest rates are higher, depositors are happier, all else equal, they're willing to give, they get higher utility from this deposit account. That makes sense, I think, okay? The second piece is sort of the piece that I would say is unusual to IO, but very standard to finance. Consumers don't like default, okay? And gamma is gonna measure how much they dislike default, and alpha is gonna measure how much they like interest rates. So the higher the gamma, the more they dislike default, the more runnable they are, if you think about it, okay? Does that still make sense? Okay, now let's forget what we have here on the right, these deltas and so on. This is, I would call, the standard finance model of, of writing down utility. And what does it get us? But that, why does it very, very, very poorly fit the data, if you think about it? It says, if we have two banks, and imagine they have the same default rate, okay, same gamma, then the bank with an epsilon higher interest rate gets all the deposits. Look at the world. You'll notice that it's for sure not what's happening. In fact, there's widely different rates across banks, and they're mildly correlated with bank market shares. In other words, it doesn't seem like interest rates are driving depositors. Deposits are sleepy, okay? So that's the, that's the first thing that kind of tells you this model is a little bit broken if you want to describe what, how depositors actually behave and how they're going to respond to changes in, let's say, interest rates or defaults. So we have this other piece here, delta K plus epsilon JK, okay? So, so let's talk about a third piece because uh, Nick already wants to talk about measurement and I haven't even set up a model yet. Okay, the third piece I think is quite important. Um, and the third piece is banking services. Okay, and I, I think this is where I think insights from IO are, are useful as opposed to just mere tools, okay? So what do we see here? Delta K is gonna be vertical differentiation between banks, okay? It's gonna tell you that if Bank of America has, a, has many more deposits than Wells Fargo, but they charge the same interest rate, it's because consumers like Bank of America, whatever banking services it provides, they like them, they're willing to pay a premium for them, or all else equal, they want to deposit with Bank of America, okay? So that's gonna be quite important because if you look at the data, market shares of banks are very different and very persistent over time. So consumers treat these banks as though they're quite different, okay? Epsilon is also important. Uh, two things that you wanna notice there. First, it's an epsilon. The second, it's got a J and a K there, okay? This is gonna be horizontal differentiation. It's gonna tell me why even though on average people like Bank of America better than Wells Fargo, why Nick might choose Bank of America, but I go to Wells Fargo. It's because, for example, I live close to Wells Fargo. Uh, I like their ATMs, I like their color, I like uh, the fact that the service that they offer specifically appeals to what I, what I want, okay? So this is gonna be horizontal differentiation. It's gonna explain why market shares aren't degenerate. It's gonna tell us that we can both, that they can, we can both have positive market shares, okay? So that's gonna be my basic setup of how consumers choose between banks. And these services are gonna be important from the perspective of bank runs, if you think about it, because they're gonna pe keep people sticky with banks, okay? Even though the default rate goes a little bit up, people don't just run out of the door. People are like, wait, I like Bank of America. So suppose there's a 100 basis points change in CDS, why do I care? I like banking, okay? So that's gonna be quite important if you wanna quantitatively explain people's behavior. The last thing I wanna say on this uh, before I move on 
is uh, units. Okay, the one thing you, you want to notice is this is in the units of utils. Utils are beautiful, uh, but they're not very useful for interpretation. If we want to interpret this in any sort of monetary sense, the way we want to do it is just divide through by alpha. Okay, if we're going to have on the right-hand side, we're going to have price. If I divide through here by alpha, I interpret everything in terms of interest rates, okay? Uh, percentages, percentage points, and so on. All of a sudden, I'm in, in the dollar territory, which is what we know how to deal with when we think about consumer surplus, transfers, taxes, and so on. Okay. okay. So piece one, individual consumer choice. Piece two is let's go from here and aggregate us up to a demand curve. Uh, before I go on, I want to tell you where things are simple right now. Things are simple. Every consumer has the same alpha. Every consumer has the same gamma. The only place where consumers really differ is in their epsilons. Okay, so this is going to be a simple demand system that I'm going to complicate later and give you heterogeneity. But even this, I think, is, is actually quite useful when you think about data. Okay. okay. So how do we go from this to a demand curve? We just have to aggregate across epsilons. For that, we're going to make a very, very convenient assumption. Epsilons are drawn from a type 1 extreme value distribution, otherwise known as logit error. Okay? Why is logit error very nice? Because I can express things in terms of choice probabilities. So if every consumer gets this epsilon shock from a type 1 extreme value distribution, then the probability that a a certain bank maximizes the consumer's utility is just expressed in this exponential, okay? What's the chance I choose bank K at time T, depending on the bank's characteristics and its competitor characteristics? It's the mean utility the bank offers, so no more epsilons, because we integrated them out, right? It's the alpha IK of bank K, gamma rho K plus delta K. So the average utility it offers, exponentiated, divided by the sum of exponents of, of everybody's uh, average utilities, okay? And that's how simple choice probabilities become. That's why logit error is useful. That's why this gets to be a super simple demand system, even though it looks like we have choice probabilities and so on. How do you get from probabilities to quantities? You multiply it by the size of the market. And we have a demand curve, okay? Now we go from having a demand curve to, wait a second, how do you estimate the demand? Okay, that's like the last step on the path. And as you'll see, estimating demand is gonna be here super simple. Stare at this thing. The S, take logs. When you take logs, on the left-hand side, you have log market share. On the right-hand side, you have log of an exponential. Well, that's just alpha i's. And then log of something a little bit nasty. Therefore, we take differences between market shares of two firms, and the nasty stuff dro drops out. Okay, And we're left with something quite simple, which is this. This is, the, this is Barry 1994 way of estimating demand. You get the log difference in market shares between, let's say, good uh, bank K and bank zero is just the alpha times the difference in their interest rates, gamma times the difference here in their uh, default rates, plus the difference in their average quality. Think of throwing in a time fixed effect. The other bank is going to drop out because we're going to use one as a new error, and we're done. Okay? We can literally estimate this with a regression. What's the difference? Because we wrote it down as a proper model. We can go from our regression and interpret parameters directly in a utility sense. We can compute consumer surplus and so on. Okay, we have a fully specified demand system that we're able to estimate with a regression. The other nice thing is we can apply all of the standard reduced form techniques for identification to this. So if Nick is worried about things being poorly measured, endogeneity and so on, we can apply all the standard diff and diff techniques, IV techniques. Notice that unlike standard IO regressions, Two things here are endogenous, price, obviously interest rates, and default probabilities, right? There's two reasons why you can have a high default probability. Uh, one is because, let's say, you have poor fundamentals or poor beliefs and so on. That's on the right-hand side. Or consumers think you suck. And if you suck, then, of course, they won't want to hold your deposits and you're going to have a high default probability. So we need, we need some shifters here. Because it's a methodology lecture, if you want to see what shifters we use, read the paper. Okay? That's the answer to Nick. Um, but the nice thing is, regression, we get estimates, okay? What's the payoff to this? The payoff is, once I have estimates, I have my, and now I'm breaking it down between insured and uninsured deposits and so on, I can first make some statements about elasticities, and I can already get pretty darn far with just demand without worrying about supply. The second thing to notice, by the way, is I've estimated demand without making any supply assumptions. So if you don't like how I model supply, you can still stick with, look, at least I learned something about demand. Okay, but what did we learn about demand? Let's start with bullet point three, 
minus gamma. So gamma equals 10.64. That doesn't tell me all that much. Uh, so it's useful to reinterpret this as a elasticity. The elasticity of deposits with respect to default is minus 0.34. In other words, deposit, uninsured deposits that data tell us don't run. They slow, sort of walk away from banks. Okay? So for every percentage uh, change in default probability, you lose your change in the market share is about 0.36%. Okay? This is not your explosive diamond divvig kind of run. This is more like your regulatory slow walk. Okay? The second thing you see is the price elasticities of deposits are pretty darn low. Uh, two reasons why that's important. First, it squares with your intuition that deposits are sticky. They don't move if you move deposits. Uh, important for two reasons, by the way. One is when you think about bank runs, the fact that people don't run a lot is going to make a, play a pretty big role. Second, even if you don't think about bank runs, why that's going to be important is you're going to have a very steep demand curve. Think back to your basic micro okay, and think about your steep demand curves. Um, so we have quantity, let's say we have price. Okay. Um, so what do you have? As price changes, quantity doesn't move that much, right? So you have demand is going to go oh, mess this up. Okay. Now, if the demand curve is super steep, and this is the equilibrium price, then the consumer surplus is going to be high. Okay. In other words, people really care about these deposits. So that's going to be another thing. Okay. Uh, the last thing I think that's kind of useful is uh, that's just for the PhD students in the crowd rather than anybody else. Um, it is useful to try to convince people that the things you've estimated actually make sense in the data. Uh, so what we pull out from the data, among other things, is these deltas, which the model tells us look like bank quality. Consumers like banks. Uh, so what we did in the paper is we just say, we just projected those fixed effects on things that kind of sort of look like bank quality. So for example, if you have a very dense ATM network, is that correlated with banks that my model tells me consumers love? The answer is yes. Uh, if you measure things like CFPB complaints about a bank, uh, does that correlate, correlate with bank quality? The estimated by the model, it does. So banks that have a lot of complaints uh, also in the model uh, look like they're pretty, pretty darn bad. Okay? But in short, that's going to be my demand side. Questions about estimating a pretty darn simple demand model. Good. Then let's talk supply. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a pretty simple Bertrand Nash model with differentiated pricing, uh, with differentiated products. What do I mean by that? You already saw my setup. Consumers think banks are different. That's products are differentiated. Bertrand Nash just means banks compete on price. That's all. Uh, now we're going to do modifications necessary for finance. I'm going to introduce bank stability into your supply side model. OK, how am I going to do it? I'm going to define a bank production function. And the way I'm going to do it is my bank production function is going to be sort of like a Leland-ish style model. It'll actually be pretty darn close to Leland. And then we're going to discuss the relationship between Leland and sort of bank run models. Okay? So how is it going to look? Every period, banks are going to go out. They're going to know the demand curve. They're going to announce prices, Okay, so interest rates. Consumers are going to give them deposits. And my banks are going to be super simple. But I think we're going to get very far with these simple banks. They're going to take deposits, invest them in a risky technology. They're going to get every period back RK back. RK is going to be a noisy, risky technology. One thing I want to emphasize is the model is going to allow for a lot of heterogeneity. So even though the technology is normal, uh, mu is going to be case specific. So every bank is going to be able to have a different sort of mean rate of return on their, on their investments and potentially volatility. Okay? And then at the end of the period, banks get their sort of their money back. And now they have to repay their depositors with interest that they promised. And there is sort of a coupon they have to pay, like in Leland, which is going to be all the non-deposit liabilities that they have to repay. Okay, So then the bank is going to look pretty darn simple. Every period is going to have some profits. These profits are going to depend on, obviously, the market share they get, the interest rates they promise. The higher interest rates they promise, the lower the profits, and the return they make on their investment. The higher the return, the higher the profit. Okay? Minus this coupon they have to pay. And what I'm going to assume in your sort of your standard Leland fashion is equity holders are 
we can, we're going to relax this later, but equity holders have deep pockets. They can choose to recapitalize the bank if there is a shortfall, if there is a, a surplus, we'll, they'll pay it out as a dividend. Okay? That's one in, way to interpret this. Another way to interpret this, by the way, is you can have a regulatory interpretation of this default. At the end of every period, the regulator comes in and says, hey, um, you have a shortfall. Either put in money or we're going to shut you down. It's, effecti it's effectively the same, but if you prefer that interpretation, I think it is closer to sort of how the world looks. Okay. But that's going to be my supply side. Okay, Why is the supply side actually useful? Uh, why does it get us anywhere? Okay. Um, first, we can think about optimal default. And this is going to be pretty straightforward with a couple of kinks. Okay, So how do we solve this? I'm assuming everybody knows Leland, so I'm not going to walk you through. Okay, how do, we walk, how do we figure this out? Well, we know that if there's a high enough return, you don't shut down the bank. If you have a low enough return, you're like, oh, you know what? Why would I recapitalize this bank? I'm going to walk away. So there's a cutoff. We're going to call it our bar. And at that cutoff, you're indifferent between shutting the bank or keeping it alive. You're equalizing that with bank's uh, equity discount by one period. Okay? Think of that. That's the franchise value of the bank, if you will. Where is this different than Leland? Uh, in Leland, you get a beautiful, unique solution. There is one cutoff. Okay? In this world, you don't. Uh, why do you not get a unique solution? Because of depositors' beliefs, which play a key difference. So if depositors think these banks are going to stay alive, they're willing to give you a lot of deposits for low interest rates, making it very profitable, both in the current period, but also your franchise value is going to be high. right? So you're like, oh, wait. If the bank were to happen to have a shortfall, I'm super happy to recapitalize this bank. So it's very rational for depositors to think that you will save a bank that has such good beliefs. Okay. Alternatively, if depositors think this bank sucks and is going to default, you're, you're going to have to pay high interest rates on deposits because, well, you have to compensate the depositors. You're going to get a small market share. Okay. So even if you have a small shortfall, your franchise value is going to be low. You're going to be walking away from that. And it might be completely rational to do so. So in other words, you can have multiplicity. And this is going to be, in some ways, how we're going to introduce a diamond divic like And it's not diamond divic but diamond divic like multiplicity in this model. OK? So and that's pretty much it. Uh, a couple of notes on this before I get uh, into, how, uh, into the result and why you would want to spend all this effort. First is, even though you have multiplicity in equilibrium, so Different R bars can rationalize uh, this stuff. That doesn't mean you will run into trouble in estimation. In fact, if you read the paper, you can prove that there is only one set of parameters that rationalizes unobserved equilibrium. So how is it possible that for any given thing you see in the data, there exists only one set of parameters that rationalizes it. But for any set of parameters you see, there's a multiplicity of equilibria. You see a bunch of different things. Think of it as best response functions are unique, even though the equilibrium isn't. If I observe what everybody else is doing, or I know what everybody else is doing in equilibrium, I have only one choice. That's optimal. Collectively, there's many choice, uh, collectively optimal choices that we can all have uh, that will get us to multiple equilibrium. Okay? So that's, that's note one. Um, note two is, how does this actually relate to bank run models that you know and love. Okay. First, this is not a liquidity model. So what happens in Diamond Divic, or think of it as Global Games, uh, Goldstein Pausner, okay? What happens is you have a bank, you promise depositors stuff, and then depositors want their money back, and if you don't have stuff, the bank dies. Uh, of course, alternatively, you promise depositors stuff, they come, they want their, their, their stuff. You could, in principle, recapitalize the banks. In Diamond Divic, you can't do it. Uh, in the sort of in standard liquidity models, you can't do it. Okay? Uh, I have a solvency model. It's exactly the opposite in that way. We promise depositors stuff. We can always repay them if we choose to. It's just that equity holders sometimes may feel like it's OK to let the bank go. So it's a complete solvency model. There's no frictions in introducing money back into the bank. I'm going to later introduce frictions, but right now there aren't. Uh, the truth is actually somewhere in the middle. If you look at the data, banks do recapitalize. Even in the crisis, they did. Uh, and there's some exciting uh, um, 
examples of, I think it was Wachovia, for example, that was recapitalized once, and then they came back, went back to the private equity firm again for recapitalizing. They're like, yeah, no. Um, so I, I think it's actually a kind of an interesting thing to think about, sort of, should we have liquidity or solvency model? This one is going to be a solvency model. The second thing I think that's useful to discuss is I have multiple equilibria. This is not a global games model. Okay. Does that mean that this is like a diamond dipvig model where you only have sunspots determining the equilibrium? It's actually, the answer is yeah, not really. Okay. So think about how the model looks. At the end of the day, what determines what our bank goes under? It's the R, the realization of the payment. So fundamentals matter. Okay. So two things will matter. First. Are you in a good or bad sunspot will determine how what your probability of default is. But then if you had a really good return on your deposit, you'll survive, even if you're a crummy bank on average. Okay. So it'll be a combination of the of fundamentals and sunspots. The second thing is equilibria are not degenerate. So if you think about Diamond Divig, you either die or you survive, for sure. Uh, here we have sort of a internal solution. At every point in time, all the model solves for you is the probability of bank default. And the fundamental realization chooses whether you're going to default or not. So I had two hands. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think the fundamental economics in that way, I, when I think about, you know, at least some dimensions of bank runs, it's not crazy to think that the General Motors during the crisis could also have been subject to a run. And in fact, if you look at my uh, ARPMP paper, we kind of do a very, very simple version of that and kind of say, yeah, if consumers really thought that GM was going to go down, they wouldn't go buy cars, um, then that would make GM very unprofitable and it would die. It turns out actually, like, when we estimate that for calibrate that basic version of the model, we didn't get that. Uh, we, we sort of, there was a possibility, but not the observed parameters. So I would say, in some ways, I'm not sure this is, I mean, there is no such thing as GM taking deposits. Uh, so I would say on the demand side, for sure, I'm going to treat banks kind of similar to a, to a durable goods producer in that way. But there is no such thing as, the, as GM taking deposits or investing them in a risky asset or anything like that. But I, I'm, the, the, I, I would say there is almost no, no, there is almost no extension to Leland outside of, I, Outside of the fact that I have the the, the, the profits, exactly, that the, the, the profits I have depend on demand, which depends on default. Exactly. You have, you have, you have, you have, you have both motives here. Um, you, you have, you have, you are correct, but oversimplifying a tad. No, 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 uh, because the second piece that comes in is the franchise value. Here we have, a, we, we have, of the consumers are going to play a huge role in, in pinning down the franchise value, right? I mean, the, the reason why you're willing to recapitalize a bank about which consumers have good beliefs is because is the next period, you're going to have high profit, okay, in expectation at least. You kind of know this was a shitty period. We just invested for it. But guess what? Consumers love our bank, and consumers think our bank is going to survive. So the franchise value is huge. We don't have to pay them very much for these deposits. And, and the same with GM, by the way. You know, General Motors also don't, doesn't have this sort of this feature that's strong. But yeah, no, that's fair. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the the second I/O piece uh, that I want to talk about that's important that plays into this franchise value thing is interest rate setting. Okay. So in some ways, we we kind of up to now we treat those interest rates that banks charge as exogenous, and I kind of implied that if consumers like you, you can pay them small rates and so on. Uh, but I want to be a bit more specific about interest rate setting, because it's going to be important. First, it's going to be a source of market power. Second, by the way, um, it'll introduce room for regulation in, in, this, in this world. In this world, instability might spill over between banks through competition. Okay? And that's going to be actually quite a feature of, of these IO models I want to talk about a bit later. Okay? But before I get there, uh, let's start with something sort of simple, which is we have banks. They compete on price. Products are differentiated so they can get rent. The first thing we have to think about is, um, do we have to maximize anything more than just period profits? Okay, because in some ways, 
as Nick said, well, if we set interest rates the wrong way, that may affect default and so on. Envelope, uh, uh, um, envelope theorem helps us a lot. We maximize period profit, okay? Perfect. That makes life super easy. We're gonna now just look at period prices, interest rates as maximizing period profit. Fantastic, okay? At least banks will behave as though they're maximizing period profit. How do things look? So this is a pretty darn standard let's call it monopoly pricing condition that you all know and love from your micro 101 with little modification. So let me take it slowly. What does your standard monopoly pricing condition say? Okay, it says, well, the markup, which is the difference between marginal benefit and marginal cost, divided by marginal cost, which I'm not gonna do, okay, is just a function of the inverse elasticity of demand. Okay? And in the beautiful logit model, things fall out in a very simple way. My inverse elasticity of demand not divided by marginal cost, is just this. Okay, so it looks super simple. It's one minus the market share of a bank times that alpha parameter, the price sensitivity parameter I estimated before. Why is that nice? If I've estimated demand, I know alpha. I can measure market share from the data already. I'm already pinned down the markup through the demand system, okay? Um, now I can learn really exciting things about the supply side of the bank from the data once they've estimated demand. What are the exciting things? Well, first, one thing that differentiates banks from, let's say, General Motors is the fact that when a bank thinks about taking a dollar of deposits and it thinks about the marginal cost of it, that's pretty simple. It says, well, I have to pay the interest rate on this deposit. This is the insured deposit. This is the uninsured deposit. Okay. I'm gonna pay the interest rate and I'm gonna pay some extra cost of dealing with these deposits. Let's not worry about that one for now, okay? What am I gonna make if I invest this dollar? Okay. I'm gonna make my mean return, and then the important piece, I think, that play that when we think about banks is gonna be this piece, okay? What does this piece really say? This piece says the bank realizes that it will only repay deposits if it survives. If it doesn't survive, well, that's somebody else's problem. Let's call it the FDIC. Okay, or if it's an uninsured deposit, it's the depositor's problem. So naturally, that whole Leland machinery will introduce will introduce risk shifting into the model, and it will introduce it into the pricing, which is very important. Okay, why is it important? If you are a shitty bank, by shitty bank I mean high default probability bank. How do you think about pricing your deposits? Well, you have some marginal cost. Fine, you have some elasticity of demand, but your deposits look. Like they're really profitable because you know you won't repay them with a certain probability. What does that mean? You have a comparative advantage in insured deposits. In other words, if you're a defaulting bank, let's call you Ally Bank uh, or GMAC at that time, that means all of a sudden deposits start looking very attractive, especially the insured deposits. Why insured deposits? Uninsured depositors understand that you're gonna default. I didn't put all these sort of parentheses and then so on in here. Uh, but these guys understand that you will default. They charge you for the fact that you will default. These guys understand that the FDIC will, will pay them. So they don't care whether you default. You don't have to compensate them for it. So that introduces risk shifting straight into the model. Okay? So that's step two. So one is you get limited pass-through, right, which is the through markups. Second, you get risk shifting. Third, because it's competition, risk shifting will spill over to competitors. Because if Andrea starts charging higher interest rates on insured deposits, because her bank is failing, sorry Andrea, my healthy bank will start losing deposits because I'm competing with Andrea, which will make me less stable. So instability will spill over even though Andrea and my bank have no relationship in any interbank markets, nothing like that, okay? And that's gonna sort of, that's gonna actually put in a role for regulating prices. So, which prices, I mean interest rates which you had back in the day, and actually you had during the crisis, by the way. Uh, when Ally Bank started jacking interest rates, they were told to stop at some point um, because of this. Okay, so basic idea is sort of, we get a bunch of action out of sort of simple Bertrand Nash pricing when we introduce little banking pieces in it. Um, I'm not gonna talk about how I estimate this because it's actually pretty darn straightforward. Marginal cost equals marginal benefits and you can express everything as observable once you have demand, okay? Uh, instead, I'm gonna jump ahead to why we were doing all this. Um, so this is again for the PhD students in the room. Um, I'm not sure I've learned this yet, but I'm trying to, which is if you've 
worked really hard on setting up all this machinery. Make sure it's there for a reason. In other words, you have some payoff to it. Um, so generate a bunch of really interesting kind of factuals, because like, otherwise, why are you putting in the work? Um, OK, so what did I start with when I started talking about this, this, uh, this sort of model? I started with saying, look, uninsured depositors may or may not run or walk away from banks. But even if we knew it, how in the world could we tell if this is going to cause bank runs? Okay. And then I said, well, I estimated a bunch of things. And I told you elasticity of deposit is minus 0.36 with respect to default. Is that big enough or small? Or can we get multiple equilibria? Can we answer this question? And the way I'm going to answer this question is, is I'm going to compute a bunch of counterfactuals and say, look, can we in the world with the same technology, so banks have the same investments, consumers have the same preferences, so everything is the same, but I'm going to let consumer beliefs float, which is going to pin down equilibrium default probabilities and interest rates. Can we get multiple equilibrium? In other words, for these fundamentals, can you see different outcomes in the banking system? And it's the banking system, by the way, not a bank. Uh, because at every point in time, you have to re-simulate the whole equilibrium because we have competition between banks. The uh, instability spills over. If you want to see either the details or all the payoffs to this, read the paper. Here is a flavor. A flavor is Wachovia, which later died, March 2008, right before it died. Its CDS in the data is about 3.3. Okay. When we re-simulate the model for this time period, there exists an equilibrium in which the risk neutral probability of Wachovia default is 56%. Okay? The only difference is consumer beliefs. In one equilibrium, consumers believe Wachovia is a good bank, believe Wachovia is going to be recapitalized. And because of that, equity holders want to recapitalize Wachovia, and therefore it is a good bank. In the second equilibrium, consumers think that equity holders won't recapitalize Wachovia. Therefore, franchise value of Wachovia is low because it's got to pay high interest rates, it's got small market shares. And it's rational for equity holders not to recapitalize Wachovia. And it's got a pretty darn high percent chance of default. Okay, So you can do a bunch of fun things like this. Uh, hopefully, the things you're doing are not just fun, but sort of are a little bit policy relevant. Uh, so you can do things like this. Okay, so what did we do here? Um, we introduced capital requirements into the model. I won't talk to you about how, I, how we do it. It's very simple. Look at the paper. Okay, I want to rather tell you, make sure you get some payoff out of it. So how did we do it? What did we do? We literally simulated capital requirements from 0 to about 0.5. And for every capital requirement, we computed the range of equilibria you could get. Okay? And computed welfare. Okay? So think of this as the welfare in the bad equilibrium, the worst equilibrium under, the set of, under each capital requirement, and welfare in the good one. In short, the good equilibrium is generally kind of sort of good. If people believe things are going to be like amazing, Things are pretty darn amazing. It's hard to ruin them. Uh, bad equilibria do get better as you increase capital requirements up to some point. And then if you tweak the if you tweak the model, you can get a little bit of a stronger inflection. Okay, but you get sort of you know in the very basic version, capital requirements over 30% kind of get you something that maximizes the worst equilibrium. Whatever your sort of feelings are about how you should choose among these things, I don't know. Um, but you know, you see something like the really terrible equilibria go away after like 15 percentage uh, percent. Yeah. Oh, I don't even know what the best is. Well, I mean, let me let me be precise. Uh, you, are you talking about the worst best or best worst? Uh, you're talking about the the worst. Yeah. Um, so I think what happens is in the zero capital requirement, and that gets as we perturb the model a bit, that starts going away. Um, but uh, I'm trying to remember, I need to remember that one. Okay, but let me. Uh, I, it's been two years since I looked. Uh, no, I don't. I actually don't think it is. I, oh, it's Excel. Um, no, it's 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 not it's it's not it. It's not it. Um, and then then and then we do. Uh, and and then again we do we do a bunch of fun things uh, with the model which I also, again, recommend that you, if you ever do this kind of stuff, perturb your model. You can do risky assets. You can do introduce safe asset investments. You can put in too big to fail. You can do something that looks like costly equity issuance in it. That's going to be useful. Um, you can put direct bankruptcy cost, which won't affect anything but how bad the fault is. So for, uh, so, um, and then you can even put things like Greece. 
uh, in, which is like deposits are insured, but people still run. Um, very weird things, by the way, happen when you do this. Like a, a lot of times in these models, I always thought I understood a model until I put something else in. And then something happened that I just didn't quite expect, and then I had to figure it out all, all over again, uh, the value of models. Um, but anyway, so that's sort of that's going to be my basic um, basic introduction, I would say, to banking and I/O. Uh, I have another. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to switch now from like a basic model of bank runs to something a little bit more modern that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, why are you doing this to me? Um, which is thinking about how the financial intermediation sector has changed since the crisis, thinking about the competition between banks and their less regulated brethren called shadow banks. Um, the nice thing uh, about this paper from methodology lecture is I'm going to introduce a bunch more richness into the demand system. And I'm going to be able to tell you why that richness is actually useful. Uh, and try to talk and talk a little bit more about the methodology of kind of estimating now demand on a much richer system. And then hopefully talk a little bit about supply side um, and how did I think about introducing one dimension of banking I didn't quite realize was important until I started writing this paper, which is the fact that banks can securitize stuff. Turns out it's actually important. Uh, which, if you're, you know, as Andrea said, like, what, what, what's a bank? First, that was a totally balance sheet model of a bank. And once you look at the data, now you realize that balance sheet models of banks are a little bit silly, uh, at least to at least to some degree, uh, when you think about lending. Um, but uh, but so we're going to think about how we introduce uh, some of the non-balance sheet piece and how they interact. Okay, so. Uh, what are some of the things I'm going to want to take you to take away from this piece? I'm going to massively expand the demand system. I'm going to make it much richer. So now we're going to go closer to not quite the frontier of I.O., but close enough that uh, we are at where we need to be to do realistic models. So we're going to do BLP. Okay. Uh, so random coefficients, way more heterogeneity. Why is heterogeneity going to be important? It's going to matter first if you just want to match data. It's going to be useful. You're going to have much more realistic substitution patterns. If, let's say, you shut down a part of the market, or if you take a product away, if you reprice something, if you tax something, and so on. Uh, second, heterogeneity is going to be important because I'm going to really want to think about distributional consequences. I'm going to think about what happens to rich versus poor, or let's call them rich versus middle class, or something like that. Um, who gets affected? Is it the people in the high, how high, high house price areas or low house price areas, and so on? Okay. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about is um, how I'm going to think about the idea of the intermediation system rather than a banking system. Uh, so what I'm going to encourage you to sort of think about is um, thinking about shadow banks more, because they've become an important part of the intermediation system, and especially their strategic interaction with banks. Uh, I'm going to try to model that a little bit. And I think what's going to be kind of cool is in some ways, we're going to introduce a little bit of modern banking into the banking model. So banks are going to be able to choose whether they want to keep things on the balance sheet or put it off their balance sheet in an interesting way, and it's going to be important for the data. Okay? And then on the estimation piece, I think I'm going to try to push the fact that we can take BLP, which was meant to kind of match market, size, market level data, and it's good with market level data. But we can introduce micro moments into the data, which is going to bring us closer to our reduced form kind of friends. Uh, so we're going to do a bunch of reduced form-like identification, but still link it to a structural model. So kind of good identification, but interpreting it in a, in a model is going to also be super useful. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that. And the second thing I'm going to talk about a very little, it's going to be important, is to think about discrete continuous choice. Most of the time, we are OK with doing discrete choice models. So every consumer picks one product, and it's, let's call it a dollar. When you think about mortgages and how big of a mortgage you want to get, that doesn't fly very well. You have to think about combining discrete continuous choice. Uh, and we did that. And there's a, also a nice uh, paper by Matteo Benetton that, that did something like that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before I get there, I'm going to run through some facts really quickly so you guys can see what I'm targeting my model at. Okay, Because talking about a model without data is kind of funny. Um, OK, so my world that I'm going to be looking at in this paper is mortgage origination. And I'm looking at two market segments. I'm looking at conforming. And I'm looking at jumbo. So this is pretty much most of the market. Okay. 
what I'm looking at is 07 to uh, 16, and I said mortgage originations. So who actually lends the money, not who holds the mortgage, okay? What do I want you to notice? Um, fact one, um, jumbo mortgages went from sort of, you know, being a good share of the market to shrinking down to about one third of the size by the time we're done in 2009, to kind of coming back, conforming loans on the volume side, and we kind of going up and down and up and down a little bit. Okay, so kind of different trends in these two markets. Fact one I want you to notice, kind of interesting. The second thing I want you to notice is that banks have been losing market share like crazy in the conforming market segment, okay? So 2007, banks originate a little bit below 80% of conforming mortgages. By the time we are in 2016, it's like a little bit over 50%. Okay, so banks lose, you know, 20, 30 percentage points of market share in less than a decade. That went to shadow banks. Uh, and if you want to sort of read about this, we have sort of an, an earlier paper that documents a bunch of stuff. The one fact I want to focus in this paper on is jumbos look very different. By the time it's all said and done in 2016, banks still are pretty much a dominant originator of jumbo mortgages. Okay, so what I'm going to try to kind of get at in this paper is a little bit about why do some activities migrate to the shadow banking sector and others don't? Um, and how much? Can we explain what the economics are and, and can we do something quantitative about it, okay? And can we say something interesting about policy? Okay, so that's that's sort of the first set of facts that show, hopefully should tell you something interesting is happening in these two markets and it's different. Okay. Let me re rejigger these facts a little bit uh, to get you a bit of a more flavor of what's been happening, okay? So right-hand side, I've taken that first picture and I've just literally divided jumbos by jumbo plus conforming to get the market share that jumbo mortgages have in all origination, okay? And what you see is, not surprising from when you saw the picture, jumbo mortgages were about a third of the market at the, uh, in 2007, go down to 10% and rebound, okay? The th second thing I wanna show you is the pricing of jumbo mortgages, okay? I flipped the standard jumbo spread. So what, what does this mean? This means that jumbo mortgages became expensive relative to conforming, and then they went, became cheap again. And notice that these two pictures are not that different. Okay, so jumbo mortgages, as their quantities decline, their prices are going up. Yeah. No, it's not actually. I, I, I can show you this when I, uh, at discontinuity is all sort of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, so, so this, is not, this, is not dry, this is not just a change in conforming at all. Um, the, but the, the one thing I want to hammer in is, what does our standard I.O. tell us if quantity is going down and price is going up? Do we have a demand or a supply shifter? Decrease in supply, right? We have, we don't know quite what happened with demand, but we kind of sort of know supply, there must have been a negative supply shock, okay? Because otherwise, or we have some other frictions going on or some other things happening in the market, okay? Um, this is the sort of the second picture. You can make it look more extreme, but I think this is good enough. At the same time, banks capitalization kind of first cratered and then rebounded. So what I'm gonna argue, and I'm gonna show you way better evidence of this, is that what's happening is the drop in shadow, uh, the drop in supply came because to do jumbo loans, you need balance sheet capacity because you don't really securitize after, you know, 2007, you don't really securitize jumbo loans. And who has balance sheet capacity? It's banks. And what does balance sheet capacity mean? You have a lot of capital, or at least regulatory capital. So as regulatory capital declines, your balance sheet capacity declines, the supply shock to jumbo mortgages. And then as you, your capital increases, your supply increases, okay? So I'm gonna first show you a little bit of more reduced form evidence that this is happening. Then I'm gonna show you how to link that reduced form evidence to the model and sort of do all sorts of exciting things, okay? so. We already started talking about a conforming loan limit. Okay, so how am I gonna convince you um, that what we're seeing here is a supply effect and specifically, how do I link this to the big picture that jumbo loans were retained by banks but conforming loans weren't, okay? So what I'm gonna first show you is that the reason, uh, what I'm arguing is 
Shadow banks don't enter jumbo the jumbo market. That's why you can have this adjustment. They don't step in because they don't have balance sheet capacity. Okay? And I'm going to argue that's specific to jumbos because the alternative you might think is, wait a second, jumbo loans are also loans made to rich borrowers in high house price areas. So it could easily be that rich borrowers like banking services. So the crisis sort of happened. People didn't want to buy big houses. They didn't want to big mortgages. And yeah, they didn't borrow from banks. So I'm going to look at it at the discontinuity around the conforming loan limit, where mortgage turns from conforming to jumbo. And I'm going to show you what happens around there. Okay? And then the second thing I'm going to show you is what happens within banks. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. But let me just go ahead, because I want to get to the model pretty quickly. Okay? So I showed you that. I showed you the sort of the market. What I argued was a market segmentation between the conforming and the jumbo market. Jumbos are traditional banks, but conforming shadow banks enter. What you can see here is banks market share up to the conforming loan limit and right above. Okay, And what you can see is that banks don't make big loans. They make jumbo loans. Okay, If you thought that this was about consumers who like bigger loans, like to go to banks, you'd probably see something quite continuous. At the conforming loan limit, you see that the bank's market share jumps. There's market segmentation. Banks are the, jum the jumbo market. The second thing you can see is that the chance that a loan gets retained on the balance sheet of the originator also jumps at the conforming loan limit. So this speaks a little bit closer to the story about this is about balance sheet capacity. This is about being able to retain this loan. Yeah. Um, we don't have, we're now looking back. We don't have good data yet on that. I, not right now. I'd be happy to talk about it later. Um, no, I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't think I do. I think it's an interesting question of why there is a big wedge. So we do know that conforming are securitized because of big intervention of the government. And jumbos don't have that intervention. And the question is, why in the world? Oh, no, they did. It was. Yeah. No, no, I think it's a really important question of if there's a big enough wedge. Like, if there is, imagine the balance sheet capacity of banks goes to zero, but people still want jumbo mortgages. Will securitization market for jumbos arise? And at what wedge and so on? I think that's very fair for counterfactual. And we'll, we'll talk about it if we have time. I don't think we will. Um, so, the second thing I want to talk about is um, what I'm going to push is that the reason why shadow banks can't enter the um, jumbo market is because they don't have balance sheet capacity. But there's many regulatory differences between ba uh, shadow banks and uh, traditional banks. One of them is they have capital, but, but there's many others. Okay? So what I'm going to do is now look within banks. And we're going to learn something quite interesting about banks too. So what, what am I looking at here? I'm going to compare banks with different capitalization. So now we have the same regulatory treatment. Okay? And we're going to look at banks that are better capitalized and just see what is the chance that they hold on to a loan that they originate. And what you can easily see is better capitalized banks are more likely to hold on to loans. Okay? I think what's more important, and what I didn't quite understand until we started looking at this data, is you can do the same exercise within a bank. Okay? So here you might think, look, there are just some cap banks that specialize in jumbo. They're well capitalized and so on. And they keep things on their balance sheet. What you see in this picture is, no, no, actually, as banks get better capitalized, they retain more mortgages on their balance sheet. As banks get less capitalized, they retain fewer, okay? which means they have a margin of adjustment that normally we don't build into our models. Once their capital tightens, they start switching to securitization. If their capital expands, they can start putting things back on their balance sheet. And that's actually going to be an important channel uh, that I want us all to think about. Okay? The fact that banks start looking more like shadow banks when they don't have that much capital uh, is an important margin of adjustment. Okay? Perfect. The last piece before I actually get into a model and tell you something about methodology, just because so we're on the same page, is this is the market share of well-capitalized banks with uh, at uh, at the conforming loan limit. You can see that discontinuously, well-capitalized banks are the banks that lend in the jumbo market. Okay, this is again, this is not just about bigger mortgages; it's about conforming mortgages. Okay, so uh, let's skip a bunch of stuff. No, let me show. Let me show you this, the, la the last piece, because it's going to be important for anticipation. Okay? This is the same thing you kind of you all know and love already. right? This is the conforming loan limit. 
and this is the chance that a loan gets made. What do you see? Well, there are, obviously there's a bunch of loans that are smaller than Jumbo, but then there's a big spike at the conforming loan limit. What does this spike tell us? Think about a model I'm gonna be writing down. It tells us that these are all people who kind of wanted these loans, but these loans are more expensive, so they were willing to jump to a small, slightly smaller loan, okay? And the size of this spike is gonna be quite informative about people's preference. The second thing I want you to think about is, so this could be like an RDD in a structural model. The second thing I want you to think about is, it's not like a standard RDD in that people's, pref people's distribution actually also changes. So here is, the, here is one interesting thing, again, I didn't know until I looked at the data. The first thing you'll, under, you'll totally agree is sen sensible. As the conforming loan limit, uh, as a mortgage size rises, the average income to the person that gets it rises. Makes sense. Richer people get bigger mortgages. There's an interesting spike in income right at the conforming loan limit. What happened here? These are all of our people who were jumping from here, right? These are the people who wanted bigger mortgages, who had income actually that they could have maybe taken out a bigger mortgage, but chose to go down here. So we have kind of this massive income at this point, because we're having richer people kind of jump down below the mortgages they want, okay? So this is kind of broadly the facts I wanted to keep in mind when I want to set up the model. So what are the things I'm going to try to capture in a model? I'm going to try to capture the fact that markets are segmented between jumbo and conforming. I'm going to try to capture the balance sheet capacity angle on the supply side. Um, I'm going to try to sort of let banks choose what they want to do. Do they want to securitize or keep things in their balance sheet? And who lends, how much, at what price, and all sorts of stuff is going to be determined then in equilibrium. That's what we also want because we want this competition aspect. Okay. Now let's get to the fun part, uh, methodology. Okay. So I'm going to start just like before, uh, but with a little twist. Okay. So what's the twist? So we're going to have now many markets because think of, well, I'm going to want to think about the U.S. as being compri comprising markets with people who have different incomes, preferences, and so on. You have lenders that can lend across different markets if they choose to. I'm going to denote markets by C. There's going to be a lot of notation, but you can kind of ignore it. Consumers are going to be denoted by I. Lenders by J. Lenders can be in multiple markets or not. They choose, or actually they don't choose. They are what they are in the data. Um, and then the important thing is each lender is going to offer two mortgages at two different interest rates. They're going to choose a price for a, a rate for a jumbo mortgage, and they're going to choose a rate for a conforming mortgage. And what's going to differentiate those two is there's going to be a jump, there's going to be a conforming loan limit. So if you want a mortgage bigger than 419 or depending on the market, 600 something, then you have to go with jumbo and you have to pay the jumbo price. If you want a smaller one, you can then you get conformed, okay? And again, we're gonna have these non-price attributes that are gonna tell us why in the world has Quicken been gaining market share like crazy over time, even though they charge pretty high prices. Okay? That's one interesting actually fact over the last 10 years. Quicken has now become the largest uh, mortgage lender in the US while charging higher prices than the competition. Uh, that tells you there's non-price attributes going on. Um, okay, so let's start with the demand system. A lot of things are gonna look similar to what I showed you before, but there's gonna be a couple of twists. Okay, so let's talk about a consumer, I, who gets indirect utility if they get a mortgage from bank J, they can get from any bank in the market. C is gonna denote the market, T time, okay, so a lot of stuff. Uh, G is going to be, is this a mortgage that's jumbo or conforming, okay? So how do consumers think about mortgages? Well, they still dislike interest rates, but now the big difference is their dislike of interest rates is going to depend on the consumer. Every consumer is going to have a different dislike of mortgage rates. There's going to be a price elasticity individual to consumer. Does that make sense? So like Nick and I have different, you know, price preferences. He's lazier, so he... He like he's willing to pay more um, or something like that. Okay, the second piece you already know is the service component. This is kind of, you know, how much you like Quicken versus Wells Fargo versus like a shady bank around the corner. Okay, this is not, this is not new. This should look familiar from before. Here I'm only keeping track of what's observable and not for me. Let's forget about it. The second new piece outside of these eyes that will, are now the no parameters is the choice of size. So we're gonna go from a model in which people choose just a deposit or not to how big of a mortgage they want. 
So a consumer is going to be defined by their optimal mortgage size. Their optimal mortgage size is going to be FI star. So that's sort of a, sorry, no, that's mor their mortgage choice. Uh, FI is their, no, FI is their choice. FI star is their, yeah, FI is what they want. FI star is what they choose. Okay, so if you want a very big loan, a jumbo loan, you can choose whether you want that loan that you want or you want something smaller that's conforming. Okay, and again, what we're going to allow consumers is different than this taste for having a mortgage that's different from their, from their optimal. Okay, that's going to be important. So beta I and gamma I are going to pin down a consumer's dislike of getting a mortgage that's smaller than they would like. Okay? The other thing I want to mention here is we snuck a LTV constraint into the optimal, into something that looks like a conforming loan limit. Okay? Uh, we can talk about that later. It was just, it's just an easier way to introduce it uh, without that much notation. Okay? So in other words, a consumer can get their optimal mortgage size either because it's below jumbo or because they don't satisfy their LTV constraint. Okay? But the important thing is here we now have a ton of heterogeneity. Unlike before where every consumer looked the same outside of the epsilon, now, of course, everybody's got their epsilon, but everybody's got also these parameters that are how much they dislike prices, what, how big of a mortgage they want, and so on. So that's good because we want to be able to match data on like rich people are willing to pay more, rich people want big mortgages, and so on. That's bad because I don't have enough data in the world to possibly estimate four to five parameters per borrower. Right? That would tell me I need like four to five choice. Well, five to six choices for every consumer in the data. That's not happening, okay? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take our consumers and we're gonna parameterize their vectors of preferences and characteristics, okay? Their optimal mortgage size and stuff. And we're gonna do it in a way that's actually quite sensible. So we're gonna be parameterizing their preferences as a function of their demographics. So what do we know? We know that, for example, on average, rich people want different things than poor people. So income is going to be allowed, I'm not going to tell the data how much, but I'm just going to the, allow the data to tell me how much is income correlated with your price elasticity? How much is your house price correlated with your price elasticity? How much is your house price correlated with how big of a mortgage you want? Well, because like if you live in California, you would need a big mortgage, okay? Um, so I'm going to allow demographics to pin down from the data preferences Second, I'm going to still allow people with the same income to differ. So it's going to be random coefficient. Okay? So even though Nick and I have the same income, and on average people of the same income have the same price elasticity, there's still going to be randomness, and they can be more or less price elastic than I am, and so on. Okay? So we're going to parameterize this in your pretty darn standard uh, kind of BLP parameterization. Okay? But this is going to be super useful. It's going to be super useful because A, we're going to be able to talk about preferences and how they link to income, who gets what, and so on. Second, we're going to be able to estimate it. Okay? We're going to talk about how to estimate it in a second. Any questions? OK. Um, let me see. I will, I have like 10 minutes. You know what? Let me talk about demand only. I'm going to skip supply, because I think demand is probably the most useful as a tool. Uh, OK. So what are we going to do in terms of estimating demand? At the end of the day, everything again aggregates up into a mark, uh, into a demand function for a lender, from which I'm going to get their market share and their quantity. The only difference is now that if you kind of squint, if you ignore this integral and the dB back, we're kind of in the logit case, right? So for a given set of parameters, I can get my beautiful logit expression. The only thing I need to do now is integrate over the characteristics. So for so so for example. If we have people with, who are super price elastic, it's going to feed into this. We're going to get a nice logic. Okay, that's not complicated. You just need a computer to do it rather than get a beautiful, simple regression. Okay? But at the end of the day, that also tells us something about what data we need to estimate this model. What is the least data we need to estimate this model? At the end of the day, what we need data on is the market shares of different intermediaries. We need data on the characteristics of mortgages, and we need data on the distribution of people in that market. I actually don't need to know who got which mortgage if I have data across markets. So 
So if I know that there, this is a, in a market with a bunch of rich people with house, high house prices, these are the market shares of, of jumbo mortgage and so on, but in other markets which have poor people, these are distributions of mortgage and stuff I can make a lot of headway. Okay, but that means I'll need data across markets if I want to make do without micro data. If you want to look at the implementation, we're not gonna spend time on it now, but it's, it's really your standard simulated method of moment. I'm gonna have a distribution of people in the market. I'm gonna assume a correlation between their characteristics and preferences. I'm gonna simulate out my model, compute market shares, and then compare them to what I see in the data, and then loop back until we get pretty darn close. Okay. Standard SMM. This is if you wanted to do it on market data. I think we can do better, okay? Market data is great. And if you can do no better, market data is fine. But I think adding micro moments is actually quite important, especially if you want to talk to people who are who think about things in terms of microeconometrics. Okay? So what I'm gonna show you is how we did, how we took the RDD, sort of the regression discontinuity design, and plugged it into this model. And it's super easy. You just compute your moments again. Okay, so what do we do? We're just gonna look at how many people in a market are borrowing right below the conforming loan limit. How many people in the market are borrowing right above the conforming loan limit? And those are gonna be my moments, and I'm gonna stick them into the SMM thing just like anything else. But all of a sudden, I'm getting a bunch of identification that comes from RDD as opposed to a cross-market variation, and I better have really good price instruments and so on, okay? And I think that's important because first, you can exploit a bunch of institutional constraints that way for identification, and second, you can make your estimates more credible to a micro audience. Okay, so how do we think about this? So like imagine I have my model underlying optimal loan size is this sort of light blue thing here, okay? What does my model tell me? My model tells me that there's a bunch of people here who are not willing to pay the jumbo premium. They have two places to go. They can either jump out of the market or they can jump down. And remember, they will, only, they will jump in the model straight here. Okay, the only reason why, you know, they might as well get as big of a mortgage as they possibly can subject to it being conforming, okay? So all these guys are coming here or out. Okay? So how do we link this to the model? Well, my model is gonna have a prediction on how big this spike would be, right? So if I have, imagine that the spike is sort of somewhere here, okay, in the data. But my model says it should be here it's telling me about how big this disutility from having the wrong loan size is. So, you know, if my simulated data has a very small spike, it tells me you are kind of saying that the disutility from the wrong size is really high because people are not willing to go down. If too many people go down to the spike, you're saying your estimated disutility is like, is too low, too many people are willing to abandon their jumbo mortgage uh, for conforming, okay? So then you need the Goldilocks, you need the just right size at the spike to match the data, okay? And by the way, this is oversimplified because both price elasticity obviously and the preferences for size are gonna determine the size of the jump. But this is just to kind of get you an intuition, okay? Or So if you think about how we sort of are matching this, uh, the data, this is on average, this is data, this is model, how many mortgages on average live in the spike below versus above the limit? Uh, this is below, this is above, so we match this pretty darn well. How do we do matching individual spikes across the market? Okay, market by market, aside from the market with the really big spikes. Uh, there we, we are a little bit off, okay? But in short, you can introduce a bunch of microeconometric stuff into your estimation to make things more credible, and actually it goes with really nice economics, so why not? Um, let me skip a little bit ahead. Um, so what's the payoff? The payoff is you learn a bunch of kind of fun things, uh, like how sensitive are actually, uh, are, are people to, you know, pri mortgage prices. And turns out, unlike deposits, people are quite elastic in the data. You get an elasticity of about three. Uh, so people are willing to take smaller mortgages or not at all, um, to do so. Um, and, and people sort of really dislike getting loans that are too small, which kind of makes sense because it means buying the wrong house. Um, so that's kind of a big picture. Exactly, exactly, 
Exactly. So you know, it's it's really it, it's um, the model rolls everything into one. Okay. Uh, I have three minutes. Left. Three minutes. Okay. So I promised you all this exciting stuff on the supply side, which I'm totally not delivering on. Um, so let me just tell you about why in the world do you want to do this exercise? Um, because I think at the end of the day, this is kind of important. Why you want to do this exercise is because I think you'll learn a bunch of interesting things. So remember how before I showed you my my capital requirements picture and how sort of how the world changes if you up capital requirements? What we did this in this paper too, um, and we learned a bunch of kind of interesting things. One is in this world, if you raise capital requirements a little bit, or actually quite a lot, you don't get big quantity changes on lending. Okay? So why not? Two things change when you go from when you increase capital requirements. So the overall size is how many loans you make. Okay? What changes is the size of the loans originated not that much. It's just that banks retain fewer loans on the balance sheet. They switch from balance sheet lending to securitization. The second thing you see is if anyone suffers, it's the rich people. That's that's where the heterogeneity is important. Jumbos shrink. Rich people love jumbos. Rich people are losing consumer surplus. Okay, or Californian. Um, um, and then shadow banks take up a little bit of where banks contracted. Okay? And then you can kind of play with this more. And you can say, well, how does lending volume change? They actually kind of crank up capital requirements. And the one thing I want to point out here is that if we were just looking at banks, even in the data, my model tells me uh, we'd have issues with how we evaluate this policy. Okay, what do I mean by that? If I looked at lending by banks when I evaluated, like, think of running a micro experiment. I see a proper experiment in capital requirements. Capital requirements go up, and I look at bank lending. And, I, and from there, I evaluate how bad the policy is. I would say, holy smokes, look at how much lending decreased. Because I didn't adjust for the fact that there is a competitive response by shadow banks, and lending actually decreases substantially less. The second thing that, that sort of is interesting is, um, that capital requirements, despite that, get you in some ways what you were looking for. Even though lending doesn't go down by much, stuff that's on bank balance sheets goes down by quite a lot. Okay, in some way, it does go on government balance sheets. I don't know how you feel about that one. But at least it gets off of bank balance sheets. So it does have some interesting uh, consequences. Okay. Uh, let's see. You can check a bunch of things like changes in conforming loan limits and how the model performs there. It performs well. But, but where I want to, where I want to wind up, because I cheated you a bit of stuff, is big picture, we talked about tools a little, but where I don't think I spent enough time is talking about the fact that when, I, when we introduce IO logic, not just the tools, into finance, what we can get is spillovers, strategic spillovers through competition that have nothing to do with linkages between financial institutions across you know, the interbank markets and so on. And I think that's sort of an interesting in insight we need to sp think more about. And I hope my three seconds convinced you that, A, we need to start thinking about shadow banks way more and tools about how to model them. And, how the, and I think the other thing is we really need to think about sort of the securitization angle of the, of the whole thing when we think about lending. Okay? And I'm going to wrap up with talking about other people's papers just a little because uh, this is a methodology lecture. So where did I not cover stuff? I talked about discrete continuous stuff very little. It's mostly important if you think about mortgages because of mortgage size. Okay? But there's a very nice paper by Matteo Benetton. Um, another piece that's important in finance, where IO I think has a very nice toolkit, is search. Okay? When we think about search and how consumers choose financial products, I think, uh, oops, Nick, I miscited you here. But anyway, you're up there. I, I forgot your co-authors because this was like, yeah, anyway. You know who they are. Um, but, but, but why is search important? Search is important first because we observe a lot of dispersion in pricing of financial products, even for products that kind of look the same. Um, and it's very policy relevant because it tells you potentially, you can, you can start thinking about policy about uninformed people. right? A lot of policy makers, I think correctly so, think about protecting consumers from their uninformativeness. Uh, think of it as consumers as pretty kind of financially unsophisticated. Search is one way to think about sophistication formally. Okay? People who have high search costs are just bad at making financial decisions. 
Uh, so you can kind of model that. Uh, and there's some nice models to deal with that. Some of it by my co-author Ali, some of it by me with Ali in a new paper, some of it by Nick, and then a bunch of stuff by IO people on, on the mortgage market and such. Okay, and I think it's quite important that we start introducing that. There is a nice literature on introducing asymmetric information, which I didn't talk about. If you remember all of my models, there was no like asymmetric information, even though it was lending, we didn't worry about the fact that the borrower might sort into mortgages that are the wrong type. There is a literature that, we, that deals with that. Uh, some of it mine, some of it by other people. And then given that this is macro, I only put Corbet and Erasmo here because they are sort of the guys who really wanted to want to introduce IO into a macro dynamic model. I think that's sort of a nice place to look if you're interested in this stuff. Then we have some other interesting papers. There's the coin and yoga work on insurance that does uses this methodology. Uh, there is a Zhao paper. He's got a very nice paper kind of building on competition for deposits but at sh uh, shadow banks. Uh, my co-author Mark Egan with Adi Sundaram has some nice papers estimating demand for deposits. I have some earlier work on uh, shadow banks. And then Greg Buchek is going to be my PhD student on the market. This, so I'm going to plug his work as really interesting paper applying these tools uh, to the gig economy and financing. Okay? But I'm going to conclude with other people's work. Uh, thank you very much for being patient with me.